from New Zealand over here. I think it was in, in August Rush was the was the movie on the plane even. So, so we got to see it again. But I, and that was just come out more recently. I've seen it many many times. It has that same warm, loving feeling. In, in, into it. Yes. Yeah. Actually, a lot of parallels between those two movies. Yes. Very, very many parallels. Almost like a, a, an American version of the Swedish, yes. Swedish movie. What's, what's the name of that one? A lot of that. August Rush. August Rush. Oh, you're in it for a big really treat. Yes. You've never seen August Rush. Yes. That's the great one. You'll be just staying in the movie theater and not wanting to leave. <laughs> what was the one about the spotless mind, too, you mentioned? Yeah, eternal sunshine. Eternal sunshine. The spotless mind. I'm going to be busy. I don't think it had any time with them. Is that another name? Making choices yes. of eternal how sunshine. you see the world and mm -hmm. wanting to see things through a different perspective, but then living and working in the ugly, controlling world. Um, there's so much resistance showing up every step of the way, every moment of the day. How do you sort of work with that? Laughing. Yeah, I started off uh, with 10 years of university and then getting ready for my career path and, and so forth. And, and when I first came across the course, already I I think when I was going through career placement and development and looking at, at that whole thing of what to do for a living and so on and so forth, um, it started back when I was like in ninth grade and they gave me all these uh, aptitude tests and all these uh, vocational tests and everything to see what my skills and abilities were and what my interests were to try to match them up and my scores came out really crazy. Uh, the guidance counselors were just looking and going, what is this? You know, we've never seen anything like it. And my mother was a teacher, so they didn't know what to tell her or whatever. Um, what happens is, is the world that we perceive is, is again a reflection of our self-concept, of our belief of, in identity uh, that's been made up by the ego. So when we seem to have struggles and stresses on the job and job environments and so on and so forth, uh, those are all Reflections. You might say they're they're all being projected through the through the ego and through the body, uh, projected out based on our concepts and our beliefs that we hold about ourselves. So um, I think for myself, I've just tried to be very willing uh, because, like most everybody, you you grow up uh, as a child and through adolescence and into adulthood, and we're clueless. We don't have a we don't have a clue about what the, the big picture is about. We're just trying to make it through to the next day and live the life as best as we can. And then we, we take on a lot of duties and responsibilities and roles as part of being a fully functioning adult you know, citizen. And that's what I did too. And then at one point, um, you know, as I'm going through different job experiences, I had a sense that I was being called you know, like some people talk about a spiritual calling, sometimes you hear monks or nuns talk about, oh, I received my calling, or Mother Teresa, I think, was on a train uh, going through India when she got her calling, you know, to work with the poorest of the poor. And so you start to feel a calling, it's, it's different for everyone, it's a very intuitive calling towards healing and wholeness, and then Wherever you seem to be, whatever the situation seems to be, like a work situation or whatever, that's your starting point. Um, and now it's like the spirit works with you on the inside to, to loosen from that belief system and to clear away some of the, the obstacles and the debris that's in there. And so I, I always would think of what Jesus said in the Bible, you know, be be of good cheer, and he said, uh, my kingdom is not of this world, I'm calling it out of the world. And many people have tried to just run away from society and go live in the mountains. Uh, they were telling me about Mullen Bimby and all the hippies that live up in the mountains and come down for the market. But, but of course we don't escape the world by running away uh, from, from the world, we have to do it from the inside. So, 
I felt those same stresses. I mean, I, I had a number of different jobs, and, and whether it's stresses from, from clients or patients or customers or managers, bosses, or the stresses of being a manager and having people under you that do not uh, follow the rules and so forth. I mean, those are, that's just the way that the ego plays out in this world when we have a false identity. When we have an imposter identity, we get a lot of imposter experiences that are not very happy at all. They seem very constricting. So, I remember having this talk with Jesus one time and, and saying, you know, this job situation is bothering me, this one's bothering me, and, and then I would talk further, I'd say, and then, furthermore, society. <laughs> I know these people in my environment are bothering me, but society in general is bothering me. I mean, I don't like society, and what I would hear back was, uh, you think, you believe you're in the society, but the society is in you. Uh, or you believe you're in the work environment, but the work environment is in you. That was very helpful for me, because it started to turn the tables a little bit, and give me a little bit of a sense of empowerment, that. I wasn't in the environment, but the environment was in me, in my belief system. And now, not only do we have A Course in Miracles, but quantum physics is showing the same thing. I mean, now we're really seeing from quantum physics that it's all consciousness, and it's like a mirage that we project out based on our consciousness and our belief systems. So, progressively, you know, the Holy Spirit is not going to like rip the tablecloth off the table uh, while we well, the silverware and the china and everything's there, so everything goes flying. It would be horrifying, you know, to have our perceptual world ripped away from us. So what happens is, I seem to just become more intuitive and more intuitive, and and I would tune into the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would say, "Okay, this is what you're going to be doing." And, and initially, I was guided to get to interview for this job. It was a very difficult job. I would have never picked it as David uh, was working with people that were blind and deaf and schizophrenia and psychosis and, and and it was like a very intense job that was for undoing pride and for helping me get more into prayer, true prayer, letting go of all this ten years of university that I had all this past learning and learning how to pray for the first time to receive guidance. So it was very intense, and I would have described myself at the time as a very intense work situation. Things were coming at me left and right every day, and, and I would even, I'd be happy to go to the restroom just to have two minutes, because it seemed like such high stress. But actually it was, I could see from a spiritual perspective, it was really designed to start to help me undo the ego. It wasn't uh, anything I would have chosen as David, but it was very, very helpful from the Spirit. And then progressively I was given a series of, of jobs uh, where I could see that that I really was open to loosening from my ideas about having a career, but but paying off debts, you know, the Spirit, you never really abdicate on anything. You have to, even if the ego set up the mortgages and set up the debts, the Holy Spirit's like, we can work with that. Uh, we'll, we'll do your mind training and undo the ego and handle the debts and the obligations and the duties. So that's really what happened for me. It was very intense, but I was guided to a series of, of jobs. And the last job that I seemed to have, it got lighter and lighter to the point where I was teaching psychology at an art institute. And I had four hour classes and I could show full length movies and nobody checked up on me, and I had a syllabus with all meaning of life topics. And basically I taught A Course in Miracles without using the word God, Jesus, <laughs> uh, Holy Spirit, <laughs> just using psychological terms. And it was very helpful for me because I was so shy as a child in high school and college that I was voted most quiet in my senior class. So for me to be standing up in front of mainly teenagers, like 17, 18, 19 years old, for four hours at a time, with no lesson plan. Holy Spirit wouldn't let me have 
lesson plan, and I was terrified that I would just freeze, because you're not, I wasn't even used to talking. Uh, so it was all designed to undo the ego, and to help me uh, be in tune and let the Holy Spirit do it through me. So progressively, that was with the job, I was told then that's the last job you'll have in the world, and, and you're mine now, and you'll be used in ways that you can't even fathom or understand, so don't even try to worry about it. And then things got very spontaneous, and I've, I've done thousands and thousands of these kind of gatherings, and, and definitely people would say I still had opportunities in countries like Colombia, where there's still a lot of fighting and guns and things in Venezuela and different places. But, but basically, once your mind becomes unified in purpose, the danger is gone. Um, you lose all sense of danger, you lose all sense of hostility. Um, an example of that was going down to Venezuela. They were, the president down there was running mock invasions, preparing for an invasion from the United States while I was down there. And I was on like eight radio stations and two television stations, uh, right in the middle of, of this thing that was going on. But it just wasn't in my awareness, so I didn't perceive any sense of hostility or danger or friction. Even with these kind of gatherings, I never, the, the mind becomes so riveted in purpose and so unified that there's no sense that anything's uh, ever a problem. I know Raj had me here a year or two ago and there was a man who showed up at one of the gatherings who was, from the world's perspective, a bit drunk. <laughs> and, and belligerent, and uh, but I didn't um, perceive that. You know, afterwards they were saying, were saying, "Wow, it was really great how you handled that man." And at the end, the man came up to me and said, "I want a hug," and I gave him a big hug, and it was just a beautiful experience. But from some of the people at the gathering, they were perceiving that that he was disruptive, he was interrupting and belligerent and something, but I didn't receive any of that. Um, it just was like a flow to me. I was just enjoying... I guess it's a, that's a practical how to get there, how to actually do it. Yeah. Like the instruction manual. Yeah, exactly. That's all I did when I mean, people have asked me. In fact, I was on a global, like one of these comlink things where it's a teleconference all around the world with all these people. And I just met these people in Melbourne, this woman who's in a wheelchair and friend of hers, and they were both tuned in for it, and they thought, okay, hey, it's going to be in this conference call, and they were all sat down, they got all ready and everything, and one of the first early questions was, um, well, when people talk to you about A Course in Miracles, you know, what advice do you have for them? And what came out of my mouth was, read the book. And then the whole teleconference went off, uh, it just completely, that was the last three words. They were like tuned in for like a two-hour teleconference. And one of the early questions was, what should you do? I said, read the book, and then that was it. So they sat there patiently looking at each other with their drinks for like about an hour, waiting, waiting for it to come back on. Never did uh, come back on. And after an hour, they just looked at each other and went, I guess we're supposed to read the book. So they, they got the book out. <laughs> And open it up, and uh, but that's what I mean by practical. You know, you just you just hang in there. With it. If you want to actually hear the teleconference, oh, that's the teleconference. <laughs> yes, it's on. It's been. It still was recorded. Yeah, if you can get prompt to read the book. Then, uh, <laughs> you can listen to the audio CD that uh, Candace, David Paul and Candace. Yeah, David Paul and Candace did. They set up a conference call with like 200 questions and narrowed it down to top 30 questions or whatever and set it up for David and they answered it and there's the audio CD in here as well as a DVD um, and a music of Christ so like lady named Resta you see music from the angels and it's all in here mm -hmm. so as you go about your day you can listen to this and these, everything we have is a suggested donation it's back on the table the little cards that can tell you this is time for tea and coffee break so it's just the end of the uh, I book. Book? No, this book, uh, Raj, 
probably everybody said one of these is new, right? Oh, this. This it was one I had last year. Yeah, there's another, and then they made another one. So yeah, this one here is uh, set volume two, part two, Tome and Talks. So it's an original. Yeah, that's that's new. Yes, it's all new. They made another one. David was invited to uh, the Course Miracles conference in San Francisco last year, and he gave two talks, and one's a transfer training talk which is like stories about how to use it, how to train your mind, how to get um, clear on ideas regarding healing, you know, the body versus the mind, practical stories that really help get clear. And the other talk was metaphysical talks, so common errors regarding resurrection or ideas that the, you can seek for enlightenment through the body, all that kind of stuff gets undone in the second talk. And there's a, a DVD in San Pedro, which apparently I haven't seen it, but it's, no, Colton, but it's full of love and laughter and joy, and that's on here as well as another, as well as another angel CD. So, so they have new, they have new yeah, they're all new, no one's seen them. So. I think that group, the Colton group, they, they, they sang, it was like a Course in Miracles group, and they would like sing these songs uh, before their meetings, uh, which is quite a powerful thing, so it's, mm -hmm. I think it opens up with all this singing. Yeah. Because I think it's called Joint Clarity and Cultivate. That was another big song in the sun. Yeah, yeah. Is that all right? Is that on one of those? That's Bliss. If you want, you have to buy that one online. Bliss. 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 We have another one. I'll play it right now called uh, Mission Friends. You know. Oh, yeah. Bliss. Come to the table. Yeah. I'll play that one if you like that. That's number three. On Bliss. And No Control Over the World. The other night I had some stuff coming. I could, I believe I could change something, so I put on more control over the world <laughs> to get back to uh, mm -hmm. a state of peace. The serenity prayer. I, I, some people have said, "Well, the, the course is so big and thick. Why is it so big?" I said, "It's just the serenity prayer clarified <laughs> you know, for those that have the trouble of what they can change, what they can't change, and the wisdom, the, the difference, yeah. to kind of really simplify." <laughs> And there's lots more DVDs and audio CDs back there as well that you can pick through different titles. And this is a new book called Booms of Grace, which is You had this last year? New for me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's just a collection of writings. And there we go. And there's these magazines that Raj uh, made. It actually costs $9 just to produce. So he's asked for five dollars as a suggested donation for these. And they got articles from David, myself, Kirsten, and Gary Bernard, uh, based on divine problems. So learning to live with following the Holy Spirit's guidance and not having to make decisions by yourself. So, so well. And there's tea, and coffee, and cake, and cookies. Please feel free to walk inside the door and get whatever you Thank you. Thank you. My understanding from your sharing today is that for you the voice of the Holy Spirit is the same as the voice of Jesus. Um, and I want to clarify that because I know some people who talk to Holy Spirit over here and they talk to Jesus over here. So I want to have clarity on that. And then I'd also like clarity on angels, where they fit in, and Christ Council and Ascended Masters and yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You might say that that uh, when the separation seemed to occur, that the answer was given simultaneously. So, so it's like time lasted but an instant. I mean, it was like that's how long it took the Holy Spirit to heal the dream of separation is one instant, and it was simultaneous. So that's why that you could say the atonement principle. Uh, atonement is correction. And in heaven, there's no need for correction, that's no problem. But with the belief in separation, atonement was given as the answer. So the principle was given almost like, uh, how would you give an answer for a belief, a belief in craziness and nothingness, a tiny mad idea. But you, it, it, and atonement is like a concept that was, was given to cancel out the error. And so the atonement principle is where the Holy Spirit seems to begin, in the sense that um, before there was a, a separation, or a seeming separation, there was no need for a Holy Spirit. There was no need to a bridge to get back. 
to heaven because there was no sense of separation. So, this continued on, time and space continued on in many different seeming realms. Earth just being one little aspect of the cosmos, which is enormous, the Big Bang kind of a vast cosmos. And then, um, on this planet, we seem to have an extraordinary occurrence 2,000 years ago, which would be, you could call it the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, in the sense that that voice, that principle was was there all along throughout time and space. In the days of the prophets, long before Jesus, you know, calling out in the wilderness, you know, Isaiah, and, and going back to the prophets of old, that spirit was still there. Or John the Baptist, you know, seemingly coming even before Jesus, the spirit was there. But the full manifestation of the Holy Spirit would be uh, a channel or a vehicle in which there was no tint of, of ego, just a pure, pure expression of the Holy Spirit in form. And that's what Jeshua was. So that's why, you know, when we read things in the Bible, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but through me, that was the universal spirit speaking. It really was speaking through a man, but the universal spirit is neither male nor female, it's just it's the call to return to a state of absolute oneness and perfection. So, in that sense, you could say that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are synonymous, because it's like, the Holy Spirit is like the voice for God, a voice that speaks for God. God, just being abstract love, doesn't really have a voice. So instead of calling it the voice of God, it's the voice for God. Just representing, if God could talk, and would, would guide you when you were lost, then that's the way it would play out. And then Jesus was, was a man who, he seemed to enter earth like everyone does. Uh, there was lots of stories about the virgin birth and so on and so forth. Very much like in Buddhism and a lot of traditions, there's a lot of things that get added on to make the, the, the prophet or the teacher more deified. And the virgin birth certainly would be like, well, you came from a different way than the rest of us. We really wouldn't make him a very good teaching model, though. Uh, I mean, it's like, oh yeah, okay, you're perfect, right, but you had a virgin birth, that's not a bad start, you know. Uh, you know so, it would be a little bit harder to relate to the model, but no, Jesus seemed to come just the same as everyone. He grew up like children do, he had to go through the same temptations and adolescence and all the same struggles that all of us had to go through, but just felt there was a sense of destiny in there, uh, which was to demonstrate the will of, of God, the divine will, and actually kept opening up step by step and then actually reaching a state of transcendence where, where he could say, the Holy Spirit could say through the body of Jesus, I and the Father are one. It was a state of perfect unification with no ego. And so he said things like, be of good cheer, Satan is underfoot. Mm, yeah, underfoot. It's like having a snake that is under your foot so it can't do any damage. Um, so in that sense, you might say that even nowadays when people talk to Jesus or the Holy Spirit, it's the same presence. Um, some might say, well, Jesus is more of a personification of the Holy Spirit, but, you know, Jesus doesn't have a body, and the Holy Spirit doesn't have a body, and so, <laughs> it's hard to say personification anymore, you know. And he even says in the Course, Jesus says, um, the man was an illusion, or it says in there, the man was an illusion, because he had seemed to have a separate self uh, that was walking apart from other selves. And that's, that is an illusion, because the Spirit is completely unified. So, that's the first part of your question, in the sense that I would say whatever you're most comfortable. Some people have told me that they, they really like to talk to and listen to and pray to the Holy Spirit, um, because they have these associations in their mind around Jesus. Uh, and those are just forgiveness opportunities, because all those associations really don't have any merit uh, or any kind of reality or value. And having been raised Christian myself, you know, that was very much of a, 
letting go and releasing all my ideas about Jeshua and just saying, okay, thank you for speaking to me, I hear your voice, thank you for guiding me, for leading me, for showing me the way step by step. And then the more you get into that presence, you know, you, you start to feel like, wow, that's what the whole second coming of Christ is, is, is me recognizing that I am the Christ. <laughs> not looking for a man to come come walking on the clouds or, you know, come down in, in power and glory, but just starting to experience yourself as the living Christ, that's the whole the point of the teachings. You know, I am still as God created me. You know, I am the Holy Son of God Himself, or however, whatever words come. Now in terms of angels, that came up recently where somebody was asking me about the angels, and somebody had once said, you, you were created above the angels, which sounds quite high, but who we are, the Christ, is literally, you might say, above the angels in the sense that, that Christ is the creation of God, and, and Christ and, and God are one, and share the same divine mind, and, and it's totally unified. Whereas angels are like helpers. Uh, angels, just like Jesus, <coughs> was the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Angels are like symbols that the Holy Spirit uses while the mind still believes in symbols. So that's why they appear in many different forms, sometimes in different colors, sizes, shapes. Uh, they've been painted for many centuries with big, beautiful uh, wings, or they've been depicted in many different movies, including with John Travolta and Michael, <laughs> kind of a little bit of an irreverence, a dirty angel, uh, but with great love and humor. Um, and my friend Resta, who started to come and meet with me for these kitchen table talks, she just started to receive all these songs from the angels, which I think we have some of those there, but she received like 240, 50 some songs. At one time, through this process of receiving all these songs, she did ask the angels, who are you? <laughs> she asked them the question directly. Yeah. And they said, well, we're, we're very much like you might call vibrations, or like uh, notes in a song. We seem to have, have different aspects, but they're all for teaching and learning purposes. And they're basically, they can take any form, and basically any form that is helpful. Uh, to the mind, so um, we had a very popular television show, uh, Touched by an Angel, uh, over in the United States, and then um, there's been many different depictions of them, uh, and they talk about guardian angels, and, and having uh, angels with you, and so on and so forth. Many stories of children seeing angels. Um, uh, Jenny, who's been doing the filming, she had some doubts about coming over, she had two angels appear. It was like her parents appeared in their uh, realized state of who they really were, that appeared to her to comfort her and let her know that what she was doing was wonderful and she was blessed to keep going and so forth. So I would say the best thing you could think about angels is like helpers, symbols of help, uh, while you still believe in form. Uh, just. It's really the Holy Spirit's behind all of them. And even in your life, I mean, people in your life uh, can seem like angels. Sometimes they just appear at the time when you need them most, and they, they seem to be just so helpful, and sometimes they will disappear. But um, I, I kind of like that kind of a broader definition, because if, if angel did, angels are just symbols of help, we all know that the Holy Spirit can use people in our lives as symbols of help too. Lots of them. And we're all angels. In fact, uh, I think that could be a song um, we could play. We have a song by Karen Drucker. Uh, we are all angels uh, who only have one wing uh, and we need each other to fly. So you can imagine all of us <laughs> as one winged angels uh, getting into a big circle and then having our wings flap together <laughs> and who cannot reach the sky because we need each other to fly. So so that's, I think Jason's going to maybe have a look for that one. That's a beautiful song. 
And and then your other song was about your other uh, question was about ascended masters and Christ Council and Christ Council and so forth. Yeah, over the years there's been like the Sada Brotherhood, Christ Council, um, different ascended masters. Um, there's really only one mind, and so you might say that for those that have seemed to transcend this world, we could say that they could be called an ascended master. And basically, these are still symbols that the Holy Spirit can use. So, for particular people in certain cultures, or that come into contact with these ascended masters, these are symbols that can appear in consciousness or awareness, um, oftentimes when, when they're, they're called or when they're needed. And so many people throughout the centuries have, have witnessed uh, ascended masters coming to them, either appearing to them once or uh, a number of times, uh, very much a sense of being guided. So it's like working with ascended masters, uh, doing healing work with ascended masters, channeling ascended masters and so forth. It's still all symbolic. So that in the end, the whole point of all of it is to reach a state of mind where perception becomes completely whole or unified. And so where all the symbols like merge together in a state of perfect non-judgment. And at this point, that would be when the use of symbols is over. Uh, that's, that's when uh, you might say, uh, for a moment or for, for what seems to be some time, that that unified perception will seem to include lots and lots of, of those kind of symbols. And then the need for symbols and words is over. So it can seem as if they are separate entities and separate beings, but again that's still a part of distorted perception, as if there are levels and degrees of angels and archangels, of Christ Council, you know, of, of those kind of things. And yet, uh, those are all very, very helpful symbols and, you know, it's very much that the Spirit can use those symbols uh, because it's very inspiring and very encouraging. And there's, of course, there's a huge variation in different cultures. Uh, there are different symbols that are used mm -hmm. for obvious reasons, you know, like Jeshua is if you go into Islamic cultures um, or Judaism and so forth, Je Jeshua can be seen more as, as a very wise teacher, highly respected, but someone like Allah, you know, or Muhammad would be much more of a stronger symbol, you know, in, in Islamic culture. And obviously in Hindu culture and Buddhist culture, as you go through the other ones, there's there's lots of different symbols. and. I always say, whatever works, uh, whatever you feel a closer resonance with, a connection, I always tell people, use that symbol, or those symbols. Because uh, it's all just symbols being used by the Holy Spirit. It's I think all. the dictionary says, an archangel is someone who's never left heaven, but uh, walking here. Well, that's all of us, isn't it? Because none of us have ever lived in the interim. Ministering on that. Yeah. For a moment, having the dreaming of that. Yeah. None of us in truth have ever lived in the Yeah. That's good in the sense that, that it starts to collapse down the hierarchies. Yes. As if we have hierarchies. I mean, even in spirituality, there are hierarchies. And as soon as you start to get an inkling of, okay, those are all just symbols being used, but. but the clarity starts to come from the sense of, of understanding what right-mindedness is. And right-mindedness is a state of mind that just simply sees a symbol as a symbol. So imagine being in such a happy, clear state where symbols are just symbols. The most glorious symbols are still just symbols. You don't have to even figure out anything about time and space and and which one is more important than the other and everything, that they all just merge together. Um, I've had people that have said, well, if, if Buddha came before Jesus, and if, if the Course says that Jesus was the first one to complete his part perfectly and remember the true divine nature and everything, then 
then by uh, reasoning and rationality, then, uh, then Buddha wasn't enlightened and, and Jesus was enlightened and so forth. And I said, well, you know, the, the only problem with all this comparison and, and assumption is, is, is that persons are enlightened. Uh, to say that Jesus was enlightened, you know, it's just another symbol or metaphor because it's not like human beings become enlightened. But there is a state of enlightenment in which you can see the human being as a symbol. And therefore Jesus would be a symbol, or for Buddhists, Buddha, and so on and so forth. But there's no, you know, getting into comparing, contrasting, or even getting into concepts of personal enlightenment. Because then you still have disagreements and arguments as if which one came before is important or those kind of thing. It's just, you know, it's like much ado about nothing. It just gets into a bunch of distractions and comparisons. So I always teach that enlightenment is a state of mind and it's, it's not personal. In fact, people have even tried to pin me down and say, you know, what were you doing uh, when you were enlightened, or were you shaving, or trimming your toenails, or what? What does you talk about? You know, it's like there's no kind of sense of action, and you don't really have to try to put enlightenment, this vast state of, of awareness, onto a timeline, and then make it sound like some kind of an event. I mean, even with the story of Jesus, you might say, just for instructional purposes, that that before he began his ministry, his three years of public ministry, that he had seemed to reach that state, uh, so that he was just in the state of, of oneness with God, and that's why during those three years of public ministry we had statements like, before Abraham was, I am, you know, I and the Father are one. That doesn't sound very much like a person. Uh, before Abraham was, I am, and they were ready to stone him for that. <laughs> Whippersnapper, walking around with your long hair. And, Do you know how long the tradition of Abraham goes back? And, before Abraham was, I oh hit the rocks. You know? But but a lot of Judaism, like all religions of the world, are based on beliefs and traditions. And the I am presence is really not interested in traditions. It's just a vibrant presence that literally transcends all the symbols. And all the symbols can just point to it, you know. And that's like the story of Moses, you know, in the burning bush and and God speaking and saying, "I am that I am." Well, it's pretty clear. <laughs> you know, if the Holy Spirit's going to speak. That's that's kind of the sound <laughs> that you get, this kind of majestic sound. So, hope that kind of gives you a little bit of. Uh, Time, a linear construct, anyway, that yeah. doesn't really exist. Yeah, time's just a linear construct. Mm -hmm. So the concept of parallel universes that science fiction is, is quite plausible and quite obviously good. Yeah, happen. yeah, you can think of parallel universes as kind of an idea of, of life, that everything is really simultaneous and some of the different channel material, like the set material, was talking about simultaneity and mm. so forth. So that there's a lot of so there is nobody born before anybody else or anything, because exactly. they all have the same time. It kind of collapses the whole Buddha-Jesus yeah. thing, you know. Good luck on the physics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, that, it's like the, to be born again, of course, is to be born again of the Spirit. That's what Jesus talked about. But Nicodemus, you know, when Nicodemus was asking him, you know, must I come again into a woman's womb and everything, and Jesus, you know, said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Again, delineating between the temporary and the eternal. So, uh, so as you advance in your mind training, you start to realize that oh, you're flowing along, flowing along. There's still time ideas in there, mm -hmm. and uh, Jesus even uses one in the course. Uh, he calls it charity, uh, where he defines charity as a way of seeing someone as if they're much farther along in their advancement than they appear to be in form. And he says, actually, that's still a time idea, seeing them as much further along in advancement, but it's actually very helpful to see them this way, because it's a benefit to your own mind, because it's a, it's a way of seeing them as closer to who they really are, which is really beyond time and space entirely. So, I'd say that that's 
that's something to be aware of as you go more and more into meditation, as you feel more and more your consciousness expanding, you'll still notice some time concepts that are in there, and that the whole point of, of meditation is just freeing your mind of those time concepts. So there's a section in the Course of Miracles called I Need to Do Nothing. Mm -hmm. That's kind of like really going for it. You know, where you just empty your mind of everything. Uh, How do you correlate that with, I mean, um, I'm a nurse, so I'm working on time with everything, like medication time, strips have to run over certain times, we work in the cancer unit, so things have got, every time is very, very specific and, um, you know, everything is measured in minutes and hours and whether somebody's overdosed or whatever. Um, to correlate that with personal growth and spiritual development when I live and work in that environment just seems to jar completely. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how, do you, yeah. how do you try and train your mind and yet not kill anybody, yeah. so to speak? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just totally antithesis. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I, have, I did a talk back in the 1990s and it, was, it turned into this very deep pamphlet. In fact, it's a pamphlet, just a small pamphlet, maybe 20, 22 pages that Jason took to the mountains in Switzerland and would like read a line and just ponder it for days, <laughs> and read another line and ponder it. You know, it was very deep, but it was with a, a group of nurses actually. Oh. Uh, I had a, a talk one time and so we got into all kinds of concepts about time and the body and everything. And we got into decision and beliefs and took it all away. Another thing that's interesting is um, I have a friend of mine who uh, always wanted to be a nurse and she had a very rough life, it's huge extremes, you know, prostitution and all kinds of things. And she worked her way over, got into nursing school, worked her way through nursing school and became a nurse. And she said she, had, she almost sounds identical to what you were just saying. You know, she got into it to, to, for, to love, to nurture you know, to altruism, to be helpful, to serve, you know, all the, those reasons. And she said, I was, all these medications and so much time and carrying a clipboard around and she felt like she was, was managing all these systems that had to do with the body and medicine and time. And she said her heart wasn't, her heart was just wanting to just reach out and really extend healing and that's why she got into the nursing in the first place, as a healing profession. But when she got into it, she found herself wrapped up in, in almost like being a robot, uh, mm -hmm. serving the system of the hospitals that's, and the doctors. In the research that I'm doing, that's theoretically the source of my, the most stress in nurses, is that lack of um, congruence, where on, on one side it's the nurturing and the healing and the, the whole mind-body spiritual side and the other side is this biotechnological world that just completely jars and trying to work that line between the two is a source of massive internal conflict yes. and that's, that's the biggest source, I mean I've been nursing for 32 years and the, the biggest source of complete distress and conflict is, is an internal one and it's nothing to do whether you know, Queensland Health is useless or, I mean I've worked out here at the PA and the hospital has no heart quite honestly but within our unit it, it it is, there's a lot of stress, especially in the young staff that haven't yet uh, found a way to try and find a gap, but I'm finding it increasingly difficult to, to manage the, the physical world that everyone else thinks is real. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly patients who are newly diagnosed with a, a terminal disease think it's very real, yeah. and to them it is. Um, and there's no point trying to talk to them saying, well, your cancer diagnosis is all an illusion, you know, you're likely to get shot. But, and it's very heartless to sort of say that sort of thing. So trying to walk this line between what is truly um, yes. helpful um, and oh, this yes. highly technical world, because I'm an advanced practitioner, so all of that sort of stuff. It's it's just how do you make that work? How do yeah, you I've got to, I'll, I'll continue on with the story, my friend, because it, it turns into the most. You'll find this the most glorious parable you've ever heard, and this is based on what actually happened. Um, you know, Jesus would say there was a man who had two sons. Well, to continue my story with my friend, she got from waitressing and food stamps and prostitution and all kinds of things. She got into nursing. She got found herself where you're talking about, like you've been in for 32 years. And then 
She, I mean, I think at one point in there too, she was suicidal, uh, didn't have a, a strong, feel a strong connection with God, uh, felt very, very dark and suicidal. She had a, an angelic experience when she was just ready to commit suicide. Said, if you're there, uh, you better come in quick. God, kind of put God on the spot uh, because I'm ready to kill myself and and had this theme of light that just engulfed her and called her name over and over and kept saying to her, truly believe, truly fly. You know, Lisa was her name, truly believe. And she said it was just like she was in a, like a tractor beam of light. It was just so blazing that she went out and told her her two children, There's a, there is a God after the experience. But then, practically speaking, she went through the nursing experience. She actually was working with her nursing job and she started studying A Course in Miracles. Mm. And so here she was practicing this very metaphysical system, you know, at work, at home, everywhere. Before the, the big light experience, she couldn't even read the book. It was like gibberish to her. After this big light experience with the angels, you know, she, could, she said, I could suddenly understand the words. She read it, she read it, she read it. She noticed that the focus in the Course was on healing of the mind. Mm. And it was a huge contrast with her nursing experience. And so she had a number of experiences where, she told me one of them where she'd go around with pills and doing her nursing thing and there was a man there, an elderly man in this, this nursing home area where she was working, who every time she would go by, he was always trying to grab her rear end or feel her breast and uh, his name was Lester so she called him Lester the Molester. Was the nickname. Because he was, she said, oh my God, I can't walk by without Lester trying to cut the seal and she was just like, and so this went on and she kept doing her job and everything and, and then Lester's health seemed to go down and down at some point and he was kind of on his, his deathbed uh, to the point where he was totally incapacitated, he couldn't speak. He could hardly move, he's laying there in bed, and she's of course doing her rounds with her meds and doing her thing, taking her medication and to Lester. And one night, she's, re she's been reading her course, doing her lessons, <coughs> just letting her mind open up as much as she can with this nursing, nursing profession. She walks in there and Lester's dying, and he's in there, and she walks over to him to give him his meds and check his charts and everything, and she said, with all of his strength, she saw his hands going like this, and she's like, oh my God, Lester, even on your deathbed, no. And she said, but she looked again at him, and she saw those hands just trembling, and suddenly it just like, the Holy Spirit just clicked in her mind, and she saw him differently than she'd ever seen him before in that one instance, because she's practicing her, her course lessons, you know, help me see this differently, above all else, you know. And she looked at him and she went, oh my God, Lester, you're just calling out for love. It was like <laughs> underneath this behavior, she saw the call for love with his hands. He couldn't even speak. And so she was like, she felt this huge love, like an explosion of love inside her. And she felt like enraptured and she just was like, oh my God, this is what the Course is, is talking about. Mm -hmm. And then she looked around and she thought, what do you want me to do? And, and she got the guys to crawl into bed uh, with Lester and she thought, of course the ego flashed a few things through like, well this could be the end of your profession if somebody walks in that door. But she said she crawled into bed and just held him for hours uh, and, and it was one of the most powerful experiences in her life. So you can see clearly it was a nursing, nursing profession, she was like carrying it out as far as she could. And then this, these kind of things started happening, and she had a bunch of those stories. Well then, she hadn't talked to her, her father for many, many years. She, she was going around making rounds, and she was supposed to be hired, and all these nurses got pulled out of this uh, company, I don't know if it was a hospital or some kind of care facility, and they were really desperate to have a nurse, because they lost, they were at a, a very difficult time. And so, when the staffing company pulled all the nurses for some reason for another job, this company said to her, please, uh, we need you. We don't care who you're working with. You can go sign with any staffing company you want. 
We need you. You're, you're a joyful, loving, spontaneous nurse. We can feel your love and everything. We need you at this care facility. And then she thought, hmm, you, you would hire me no matter who, who I was belonged to. She thought, well, maybe I should just start my own nursing staffing company. She got in touch. Her father called her. She hadn't talked to him for many years, like 12 or more years. And he said, oh, I've been trying to find you. Uh, because I have this inheritance that I want to give you. And he was a businessman. Anyway, to make a long story short, she started up a nursing staffing company with her as the first nurse going into this one company. And she wrote, her, her father told her how to start a business and make plans and business plan. She, she wrote into her bylaws all this stuff about God. I mean, she put God and the Course of Miracles into everything she did because she was so into it. And suddenly she had a staffing company, it grew rapidly, it exploded in terms of, of being used in this world to the point that she was, had a, a girlfriend that she pretended that she had a staffing company and she had plastic, those princess play phones. She heard her girlfriend would say, hello, they would answer the phone, abundant nursing, she called it abundant nursing. In a year and a half, her payroll from startup, scratch, no nursing company at all. In a year and a half she had a payroll of 1.6 million dollars. Her accountant was said, I have never seen anything like it. And then I then after that happened and she was she was showing Course in Miracles videos when the nurses would have downtime, they were watching Course in Miracles videos. I mean she was having him read the book during downtime. It was like she was using her nursing staffing company almost as a front for this rapid awakening she was having. Now she was the CEO of this rapidly opening. People, nurses from many different counties were just hearing word of mouth about this thing of joining her company, you know, by the droves. And it just grew very, very fast. Then she met me and by that time she'd gone, she'd become very successful from food stamps and this and that. Now she was like the CEO. And she thought she had all this great power, I you need. She thought she had all this great power. It was so great that she was manifesting like the secret, you know, so much stuff that she thought it was her special mission to bring the Kingdom of Heaven to Earth, personally. I mean, <laughs> she was like going gangbusters with it. And I said, no, that's, that's really not the way that it works. So, the more she worked with me, we went through layers and layers of darkness. And she would go to psychics and be told, your function is to be a healer. Not like a nurse healer, but like a healer, like more like Mary Baker Eddy, <laughs> you know, heal the sick and raise the dead through the power of Jesus. And then she she got more and more into that, and she worked with me very closely. And eventually, I did tell her, I said, there will come a point where you'll you'll sell your nursing business. And she said, I can't even imagine that. But eventually, the prophecy came true, and she ended up going sicker sinking deeper and deeper into meditation. She's had visions where Jesus and I have showed up in her visions and all kinds of visions. And as we sit here now, she's back at our peace house, uh, I guess, at our peace house in Cincinnati. That's where she, in the hot tub meditating. Uh, uh, it's just, I tell you that parable, and there's a lot more details to it, but she went from the very situation that you're describing, just from her willingness, into a moving, I would say, closer to what I call mysticisms, or it's, it's, she's going to be called Saint Lisa uh, before she leaves. <laughs> and it's a big, it's a big stretch from a very high pressure, stress filled nursing job which she had to Saint Lisa. But she's doing it in one lifetime, so to speak. She's going that fast. In fact, when people ask me about her, I say, well, if you took three personalities from this world and you Wove them together, that would be her. Mary, mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, that's for the prostitute escort of it, and uh, Mae West. <laughs> if you took those three and wove them together. Because she's so bold and she's got so much joy, and she's just has so much joy that just radiates her when she speaks of her life experiences, people is captivating actually, because it's been such a rapid kind of acceleration. So it's a perfect question in the sense that, you know, that's that's a parable that 
that actually played out, uh, so to speak, right before my eyes. I, did, I was able to witness it. And it, it started right there, what you're talking about, where she just realized that, that that's why she got into nursing, was, was to, for, for healing, to extend healing. But it was just so body-based with all of its definitions that she just had to let go of those definitions. And one step led to the next. And it just, it was like she was just lifted up, you know, and, and that, her story is your story.